thought this day, I thought this day would never come. I thought this day, I thought this day would never come. My name is Casimiro Torres, and I lived at the Cap. I was homeless when I arrived in 2005 with 67 arrests and 16 years in prison. My name is Philip Hall. I came to the castle in August of 2016 on the day that I was released from a New York State prison after serving 30 years of a 20 years to life sentence. I was 50 years old. My name is Vilmore Tiz Donovan. I'm a 58 year old Hispanic woman who came to the castle in July of 2007 after concluding my second state prison bid. My name is Irvin Hunt. I've been calling you since I was a kid. I am a former castle resident. I'm a recovering everything with more than 50 arrests. At 67 years of age, I'm just starting my life. Fortune Society opened the castle in the spring of 2002. There are 60 beds for men and women. <laughs> To live at the castle, you have to be formally incarcerated or homeless for one reason or another. The castle was built in 1913 and was a Catholic school for girls until the mid 1970s. After the school girls left, it was the yeshiva for a few years, and then they also left. The empty building became an eyesore and eventually a crack house. Groups and private developers had their eyes on this unusual building, which could be seen while driving up the West Side Highway. The irony is, is that some neighbors protested when the Fortune Society bought the building in 1998. Joanne Page led teams to building meeting sessions and police councils in Harlem, promising that the Fortune Society would be good neighbors. Joanne's wisdom and tenacity worked at a Citizens Advisory Group from Concerned Neighbors was formed before the ribbon cutting in 2002. Still, there were pickets and protests at the opening. But things change. Every Halloween, the residents of the castle make the place into a haunted house and invite the area children in for scares and treats. Nearly a thousand kids showed up at the castle on Halloween. And as Joanne Page said, First, they were frightened of us. Now, they trust us with their kids. Fortune established one non-negotiable rule for the residents. And that was that violence or the threat of violence would not be tolerated. If we're gonna change our lives, we need a place to be safe. Fortune staff will be available for things like counseling, job finding, educate, educational opportunities and healthcare guidance. All of Fortune resources were available to us. The no violence rule was new to many who walked through our door. In my background, my home, youth houses, reformatories, jails, prisons, shelters, violence was a factor. It was part of my upbringing. I never questioned it or thought it could be any different. And we are typical of the people who arrive at the castle. We enter with a lot of baggage and none of it is made by Samsonite. We will tell you who we were when we arrived and who we have become. But we are all a work in progress. These stories, uh, our lives, are not finished. This is just another chapter in a non-ending book. When I look back, I feel like crying. I never had a chance. That's not a complaint, it's just a fact. By the time I was old enough to choose, I no longer had a choice. I was getting high at the age of 10 just to numb the pain. I was the youngest of my parents' five children. I was born in August of 1966 in Greenpoint Hospital in Brooklyn, New York. My mother, Anne Marie Hall, was a home attendant. My father, Emmett Hall, was a construction worker. Now, there was nothing, I mean, nothing in my life that would suggest the path I took ending up in a New York State prison. As a teenager, I was an introvert and painfully insecure. I mean, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. But drugs and alcohol, yeah, now that made me feel secure. That made me feel less inhibited. What a predicament. 
I was one of seven kids, a suburban girl, Long Island, with Hispanic parents. Um, Ortiz is my maiden name. I grew up in the suburbs. My parents were, and they are, protective and loving. I'm the one who shouldn't have ended up in prison, but we make choices. I was born in Manhattan in 1954. The son of a man who was in prison. Later, I became the father of a lad who ended up in prison. And there's three generations of men behind bars. The untold American story. My mom tried with me and my sister, but dad was an addict too, and an alcoholic. And he went to prison when I was 14. That man began the start of my downfall. I said that if I look back, I'm afraid that I would cry. But I don't. It's not because I'm afraid to cry. I'm just afraid that if I ever started, I may never stop. At the age of at the age of thirteen, I began smoking weed and drinking beer. There was no drama in my life, but you know, a lot of the young people my age they were getting high, and I wanted to fit in. Eventually, I became a truant, you know, because of my habits. Um, dropped out of school, minor hassles with the law, jumping the turnstiles, smoking on the train. At that point, I wasn't doing nothing with my life. When I look back, I see that I was just aimlessly afloat upon a fast falling bubble of tragedy. With me, I think that I never felt important. The surroundings were fine, but I didn't seem to matter. Lots of teenagers rebel, but I was out of control. I hated school and started drinking with the guys. And by the time I was 17, I left home. I went to go live with a girlfriend and she was a disco doll and that's when my downward spiral began. I went to PS43 in the Bronx. And I was a good enough student to be selected to, a, to attend an elite junior high school and take special classes. I, didn't told, I told everyone that my dad was dead because I didn't want anybody to know that my father was in jail. I started using when I was in the eighth grade and was selling drugs at 15. And I became a father at 15. Jeff, my son. His mother was only 13. I never knew there was an upside to rebel against. My mother had nine kids from three different fathers. Mine, I never knew him. I knew he was from Puerto Rico and he was in the Navy, but that's it. My mother tried, but she was an alcoholic. My house was where all the junkies and thieves hung out. When I was five and my brother Amino was six, the guys that hung out in my house, they'd make a ring. They'd put us into it and make us fight. We'd have to fight until one of us was hurt or just bloody enough. And the men would bet on us like a dog fight. Afterwards, we'd take care of whatever cuts and bruises we had and sleep on a mattress in the back room. Everyone was so outraged by Michael Vick and the dog fight. I wonder where they were when I was a kid. By the time I was 20, the drugs had completely taken over my life. I was living at home with my parents, but my girlfriend Maureen had become pregnant with our daughter. I was working off and on, but I knew I wasn't living right. I was stealing from home. I was just filled with self-hatred, anger, guilt, and shame. By the time Maureen was second when I was pregnant with our second child, she got together with my family and they suggested that I go into an inpatient treatment program. But I decided that I wanted to go into the military. In those teen years, oh God, those were tough years. I had no self-esteem or self-worth. I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. I guess I was looking for love because I didn't love myself. I'd hang out all night and sleep all day. When you are that young, you think you know it all, but you don't know where you're heading. You make choices and good or bad, it's what shapes your life for years to come. My first arrest came when I was 18. I sold some hats so, so I could pay for the drugs I did. The irony was that my mother was a milliner. My mother made hats. I was given six months probation. But nothing changed because probation provides no guidance. All of that drinking and drugs around my house, 
that was the norm. People OD'd, had night fights. Ambulance and cop cars were constantly in my house. My mother hardly noticed. When I was six, the six youngest of us were taken away from her. As we were leaving, my mother gave me a St. Christopher medal. She told me it would protect me. We were taken to an institution upstate New York where we were immediately separated. Nina and I were sent to a cottage called Eleven Hayden. Now at home with my mother, we were raised with no structure and no discipline. Eleven Hayden was run on strict discipline and obedience. When we arrived, I was greeted with a smack that sent me across the room because I said I wanted to go home. I was six years old. I had already experienced fear, but I was about to learn about fear on a whole new level. Two months away from basic training and two months before, two months away from going into the military. I committed a crime of violence that caused immeasurable suffering for so many and led to me being incarcerated for the next 30 years. And I tell you, I was, even though I was emotionally numb at that point, I still remember the shame, you know, I felt for what I had done. And I pretty much felt I deserved any bad that came to me. Every club I went to, they were doing coke. It was the late seventies and I lied about my age and I got a job as a bartender. One customer named Junior, Junior was a star. Everyone gave Junior their attention and I wanted to know why. So I began to have a relationship with Junior and Junior introduced me to Coke. We'd go out and we'd have the best tables in the house. We'd stay at fancy hotels. I finally thought that I was somebody, that I was important. Then I started selling drugs myself and after a while, I didn't need Junior anymore. I became Junior. My life consisted of partying all night and selling drugs. I was using more than ever, but you see, that didn't matter because the drugs, the drugs made me feel like I was important and I was somebody and everybody wanted me. I finally was the star. But in reality, I would go home and cry myself to sleep, begging God to help me. Mm. Then in the morning, I would start all over again. And all of those feelings of loneliness and low self-esteem and no self-worth and the need for help, it was all gone. Well, less than two years later, I was in jail. Rikers Island, 20 years old and arrested for a drug sale. That's when I first witnessed prison violence. I was there for 45 days, then dumped back on the streets. Over the next 30 years, I was in and out of Rikers over 50 times and almost always drug related. One time I was on the rock for 44 months. And I was released. And in the morning, I was high again. And there was no treatment or motivation. I was virtually homeless for the next 10 years. I was the guy you would see when you got on the subway to go to work. And I'd be asleep at the end of the car. Hanging out on 59th Street in Columbus Circle. Sometimes I'd get arrested for sleeping on the train. Or jumping the turnstile. And it was the life you lead when drugs are everything. I spent my entire childhood in places like 11 8. From time to time, I'd be sent back to live with my mother. But before too long, I'd be back in Eleven Hayden, or someplace worse. Eleven Hayden had three counselors, two women and one man. All three were abusive psychos. If we ate too slow, we were punished with a beating. To this day, I find it impossible to eat slowly. They'd make us, they'd wake us up in the middle of the night and make a squat holding a gallon of bleach in each hand, and then they would tell us if we put it down, we'd have to drink it. They'd make me sit under a desk Indian style in a dark room for hours, just waiting for them to decide my punishment. Usually a few punches, a few slaps, or they slam me into a few walls. But sometimes it was worse. But they had their own clinic there. Once I spent an entire winter in that clinic, when the time came for me to go back, naturally, I didn't want to go back, but they sent me back anyway. Just about anything abusive a person can do to a child I experienced at some point. After being convicted, I began serving my sentence. I was sent to Sing Sing, where I would spend 12 years. Now, at Sing Sing, 
I didn't get involved with any programs, any, any much of anything. I pretty much just kept to myself and just did the time, which also meant that there was no positive development in my life. I just sat around and read books. I was losing my identity. I no longer knew who I was. I wanted to be right, to be right, to do right, to be a better person. I tried drug rehab, but was too scared to find out who I was. I put on this mask and tried to fool everyone, but only winded up fooling myself. I just wanted to be loved. I met a bartender named Jimmy Donovan in 1993. We got married just to get married. I was more in love with the thought of getting married than being in love with the man that I married. Well, in between all the ins and outs of jail, I did two state bids. One for four years and another for five. Both for drug possession. And so looking back, I have to say that my mother was sadly my biggest enabler. She did what she knew, but no one teaches you how to deal with a drug addiction, son. When I got in trouble, she was my proverbial shelter and soup kitchen. When I got in trouble, I did these things, and when I got back, I clean up there and I go back to the streets. When my dad would come out of prison, he and I would hook up together and 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 get high together, booze and drugs. Sadly, he passed away in 1987. Our relationship was, well, I feared my father more than I respected him. My mom died in 2006, and and I'm not blaming them. That's what they knew. That was the world we lived in. Lino and I soon began to run away from these places. We had no idea where my mother was, so we would sleep in the woods. Or when we made it to the city, the tunnels of Grand Central Station, Port Authority, Central Park, places like that. We have been raised stealing food. So we just continued to survive doing what we knew how to do. They always knew when we broke into a house because only food would be missing. It was at least 10 years in when I wrote a short story and showed it to another prisoner. After reading it, he told me about a theater program ran by, run by RT, Rehabilitation to the Arts, or RTA. I attended a few meetings, and I'll tell you, I think it was at that point that the redirection in my life began. Guess what Jimmy Donovan wasn't? He wasn't the answer to my needs in my life. In 1995, I had my first arrest. I was working for the president of a rehab center, but you know, a dirty urine led me to being fired. I responded by going out on a coke binge. On a drug-related charge, I got my first prison sentence of three to six years in a New York State prison. I was 39 years old. My first son, Jeff, who was born in 1969. His mother, Julie, was the 13-year-old I mentioned earlier. She died of AIDS in 2000. And I really saw them the drug-addicted, absent father. <laughs> uh, I, so my son Judd went to prison in 1988 for a drug sale. And in 1983, I became the father of another boy, Joey. His mother moved out of the city to Maryland, and I have never been a part of his life. By the time I was 15 years old, it was all about getting high. Alcohol, acid, and weed. At this point, my mother was in a hospital somewhere, and I had been living in an abandoned building. And I was tired. I was tired of being dirty, tired of being hungry, tired of being tired. I decided to commit suicide. I was raised to believe suicide is a sin that sends you to hell. But at that point in my life, I figured, how much worse can hell be? So I took a bunch of pills, and the next thing I know, I wake up scrapped to a bed with tubes hanging out of me. I had been in a coma, but I pulled through. A shrink sent me to Westchester County Psychiatric Center for a 90-day evaluation. Nine months later, I was still there. So I stopped taking the Thorazine they had been making me take, and together with another kid climbed out a third-floor window using sheets. The kid I was with got caught as soon as we hit the ground. But I ran into the woods, 
and I didn't look back. I made it to my girlfriend's house in Brooklyn. Two days later, I was picked up by the cops and brought back to the hospital where I was reevaluated. This time, the doctor said I was no longer a danger to myself, or maybe just not worth the trouble. So I got my brother, and we hit the streets. After attending a few RTA groups, I began reading plays. I had never seen a play before in my life, but something clicked. I began understanding and recognizing the characters and the plays and the situations that they were in. I saw myself in many of the characters, especially the plays by Arthur Miller, August Wilson, and Lorraine Hansberry. Those plays and the characters in them, they had power. I started looking for books about playwriting and reading the weekly New York Times critic reviews. Sitting in my cell, I began writing a play. Now think about that. I had never seen a play before in my life, and now I was writing one. In prison that first time, I didn't do any real work on myself. I took all the programs, drug-related and otherwise, but I just talked the talk because I knew how. I relapsed when I was in work release, and I made the decision then. And that was in 2001, and I have been drug-free ever since. You see, that last drug trip, it scared me. I don't know what happened to me for a 15 hour period. I totally blacked out. Now, where that should scare everyone, it doesn't. It scared me. Let me explain. I remember looking at the clock and it was nine o'clock that night. My next conscious moment was noon the next day. And when I woke up, I had drugs and money in my pockets and I have no idea what happened. I don't know if I robbed somebody. I don't know if I killed somebody. I don't even know if I was raped. I went for HIV testing the next day because that was it for me. I had hit my rock bottom and I just wanted something else. It wasn't until after my second prison term that programming started to matter to me, you see, because there's nothing in the prison atmosphere that makes you want to change. Prison, it can't motivate you. It's a very negative atmosphere. But when you're ready for change, you can get past that negativity. When I started to change, when I wanted it to change, prison, it couldn't stop me. In 2002, when I was released from Oneida, a medium state prison, Parole sent me to a drop-in center. It was called the Open Door. And that's where you would sleep, sitting up in a chair with your head on a table. You would have to check out in the morning with all your possessions. And then you had to check back in by 9 p.m. that night if you wanted to sleep in a chair, sitting up with your head on a table. By the time I was 17, I was already involved in hard drugs. Mostly heroin, crack, and cocaine, but I was still drinking, smoking weed, and taking acid. I was running the streets of Hell's Kitchen. I was already well-educated in the art of thievery and even robbery to some extent. But my addiction became all-consuming, and I began to carry a gun. One night, my brother found me and told me I had to come to my sister's house because my mother was sick. When I got there, I found out that she was already dead. The next day, I saw her in a casket, and I told her I was sorry. Sorry I wasn't a better son. Sorry she had such a hard life. Sorry I didn't make it any easier on her. The day after my mother's funeral, I went on a run that led to my first adult arrest and my first trip to Rikers Island. This was not to be my last. RTA was presenting plays for the prisoner population and members of the community. I became an actor. We had created a play called Reality in Motion, written, acted, and directed by prisoners. I was cast as a member of a gang. Then a man named Richard Stratton came to visit us. Richard, he had done time and he had been a member of Fortune's board. Richard had written a book and a screenplay for a movie called Slam, and he gave us 
permission to adapt it for a stage play. My third play as an actor. RTA was a laboratory for me. A lot of the old timers started giving me positive direction and guidance. And, you know, that's the thing about prison that's hardly ever spoke about, spoken about. You know, the positive guidance from a lot of the old timers, many of whom will never see the streets again. Then a man named a radio host, named Fielding Dawson, came to Sing Sing to conduct a writing workshop. His radio station, WBAI in New York City. And the same old timers who was giving me the guidance, they were like, yeah, you got to go. You got to check out that radio station. And it literally became my lifeline. I came home in January of 2003. No drugs. But have you ever heard the expressions of a dry drunk? Someone who isn't drinking, but still has the behaviors of a drunk? Meet Vilma. I wasn't getting high. I wanted to do right, but I wanted everything right away and nothing was happening fast enough for me. I took a job that I hated. I rushed into an ill-fated relationship. Coming home from prison that first time, it didn't prepare me for reality. I was rearrested in September of that same year on another drug sale and received a three-year sentence. I was back in state prison. My parole officer at the time ordered me to go to the Fortune Society, which was then on 19th Street. And I got myself there on paper only. Fulfilling parole is the man. I walked in, I filled out all the questionnaires, and then I walked out, continuing to live on the street and getting on. Two years later, in 2004, at the age of 50, I had to go back to Fortune because I had police contact. So I needed the paper to cover me. And they told me about the castle, and I became a resident. The irony is that some years earlier, I lived in that building, and it was a crack house where I lived for the next two years. I did everything that was expected of me. I went to all the meetings. I charmed everyone. I was a model resident. <laughs> Except for one thing. My big secret was that I didn't do any of the hard work. Barry Campbell would tell us, if you don't deal with your demons, life is going to come back and bite you on the ass. And he said that I had to dig deep inside to find out why I sabotaged myself. Remember, I was a kid selected for special classes in junior high school who ended up at Rikers Island for a mailing address. When I wasn't sleeping on the subway trains and, 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 and getting high, I was Mr. Charming when I left the castle. 18 months later, the demons were still there. Some of the drugs. You see, when you self-medicate, you can ignore the demons and the pain and the hurts and the feelings of abandonment. When I finished the processing at Rikers Island, I was put in a dorm with about 100 inmates, other adolescents. I looked around and saw the dorm was made up of eight sections, all double bunked, with a space referred to as Broadway running up the middle. There was a TV, day room, bathroom, shower combination, all enclosed in glass so the COs can see what's going on at all times. Privacy and modesty are things you leave at the gate when you come to jail. I laid down on my bunk and I thought to myself, how am I going to be here for a whole year without going crazy? Little did I know, this was only the beginning. I started listening to David Rothenberg on WBAI on Saturday morning. David talked about the theater. He talked about prisons. He talked about reentry like he was talking to me. Until then, I hadn't given much thought about getting out. But something inside me had changed. David was talking about the Fortune Academy and about the castle, and it sounded like a good place for me if and when I ever got released. But in the meantime, I was working on my play called The Nigger Trial. The play, it took place over two centuries, today and during the time of slavery. I remember because an NYU student named Lisa Brenniger, who worked at RTA, she introduced that play to NYU. During my second prison term, I knew I had to do things differently. Perhaps I was starting to grow up. 
I began to write several places about housing because I knew I could not return back to Long Island. And one of the places I wrote was the Fortune Society because word was out about the castle. I received a letter telling me about the services, employment services, uh, uh, outpatient, education, health services, but a bed at the castle could not be guaranteed while I was still locked up. So I made my time in prison work for me. I started programming, um, involving myself with groups and sessions that would help me explore who Vilma was and what Vilma needed to do to have the life that she deserved. This wasn't as easy as it sounds. Oh, I was tired. I wanted to try again. The castle has a second chance policy. I remember Joanne Page saying at a Thursday night meeting that if you've been drugging for the past 20 or 30 years, you might not get it right in a 28-day treatment program. Relapse is a part of the story. Most programs boot you out after a relapse. Ah, but not the castle. And I will become the ultimate challenge for their second chance and third chance theory. The next 20 years of my life was drugs, jails, alcohol, or prison. When I got my first state prison bed, I thought I had made the big time. My sister Elizabeth told me, you need to stop whatever the hell it is you're doing. You want to end up 50 years old sitting in a room by yourself? I told her I'm already sitting in a room by myself, and I'm only 19. Prison for me was like going from junior high to senior high, because I was raised in institutions. And my first bid upstate for me it was mostly drugs, fights, and tattoos. It was like a circus. I got into fights, into weights, and into the box. I would do a few years, get released, join up my brother, and hit the streets. And do what we know how to do. Steal, rob people, sell drugs, get high, and of course, get rearrested. Change comes slowly. In 1995, I met a woman. She was the first and only person I could ever talk to when I wasn't high. Not only did NYU accept my play, they informed me that they were going to give it a full production. <laughs> Can you imagine how I felt sitting in my cell realizing that I was a playwright? I mean, the praise I would get for my writing for the first time in my life, it filled me with the honestly earned self-esteem. I remember I wrote to David Rothenberg at WBAI radio and I asked him to attend the play. David agreed, and the next week, I'm sitting in my cell again, listening to David praise my play over WBAI's airwaves. While on work release, I found the website for the Fortune Academy, and I called Patricia Brown. She was the director at the time, and I told of my situation, and she gave me an appointment for an intake. Now, I learned that it just wasn't a bed, but that they were looking for people who were committed to changing their lives and Boy, was I ready. I was released on July 6th of 2007 and I came right to the castle. I walked through the doors and I was overwhelmed by the residents and the staff. You see, I was being welcomed home. They said, welcome home, Vilma. I knew that I was in a good place, the right place for me, and my life was about to change forever. Well, 2009, I was back. And again, I ran groups, I spoke well, I kept everyone amused. I listened to everyone's problems and their hangups. I gave good advice, but I forgot the most important thing, me. So I went back out again, a three-quarter house, a no-quarter house in the streets, after the drugs. I fell in love. I knew that I loved her because whenever I told her I loved you, I always felt like the word love for her just wasn't enough. Ellie and I moved in together. She became pregnant. And in her eighth month, I was rearrested. Because of my record, they gave me two to seven and a half. So I did another five years. During this time, my daughter Cassie was born. And when I returned home, I was a husband and a father with no preparation for either role. But I got a job 
and I was good at my job. But can you imagine a guy like me coming from where I come from, a husband, father, responsibilities? Scared the hell out of me. It scared the hell out of me. I went back to the streets. One day I was high and sleeping in the park on Madison Avenue and 23rd Street. A guy I know helped me about the Fortune Society. He told me I can get a metro card there if I had done any time, even a single day. I was thinking I could get this card, sell it, and be that much closer to getting high. I saw a case manager there. He offered me something to eat, and he started to tell me about the castle and all the good things they had to offer me. I was just thinking to myself, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me the metro card. They began moving me around from facility to facility. I became eligible for parole while I was at Otisville, a medium security facility. While at Otisville, I learned that the Fortune Society would be coming to present a play, The Castle. I signed up for it immediately. And that was the day when I met David and other members of the cast, including Vilma and Cass. Sitting in the audience, I learned about the Fortune Academy and the residents there. But sitting in the audience, a prisoner thinking about parole, it never occurred to me that one day I'd be a part of the cast. That play, it altered my thoughts. I wanted to go home. I wanted to try life again. I was showing my room at the castle and I met my roommate and we hit it off right from the start. She was just as motivated as I was about making changes in her in our lives. So we became each other's support system. On that first night, oh, I just cried. I cried because of the joy I was feeling. I knew I had arrived. I was finally going to get my life together. Now I'm living in a place with 56 men and three women. It wasn't scary at all. You see... They've become my brothers and my sisters. And we have one thing in common. We've all been incarcerated and we're all just looking for something better in our lives. I did part-time work at WBAI, answering phones during their fundraising drives. People will pledge and get theater tickets. And if there are any tickets left, I'd grab them. Ah, Mr. Broadway. But David Rothenberg started saying no to me. He said, come back to a Thursday night community meeting. You need that more than you need a Broadway musical. You see, they don't give up on you. And I was pretty worn out. I knocked on the castle door for a third time. And once again, they opened it. I went back to the park, hit the streets, got picked up and sent back to Rikers on a 45-day skid. That arrest was July 27, 2005. Something happened on that last trip to Rikers. I can't explain it. All I can say is that I finally had enough. I didn't want to get high anymore. I called my wife and she was there the next day. We talked, she cried. I could have gone back to when I was released, but I made that mistake already. I knew I couldn't go back to her without first learning how. So I went back to Fortune. As fate would have it, I saw the same case manager. Again, he offered me something to eat, and again, he told me about the castle. This time I listened. This time, I didn't want a metric card. This time I wanted my life. As a kid, and even as an adult sleeping on trains, I always had a book in my back pocket. Reading saw me through a lot of tough times. I used to read about King Arthur and Camelot. And whenever we were evicted, I would always think to myself, if only we had a castle then nobody could make us leave. Well, after more than 40 years, I finally found my castle. After 30 years, which included six parole board appearances, I finally made the board. August 30th, 2016 was my release date. I had been accepted into the castle, which is exactly where I needed to land because I had been locked up from the ages of 20 to 50, so I need a lot of re direction with reentry. On my first day out, after I arrived at the castle, I walked around. But I remember being greeted there and all throughout my time there being helped by the staff and the residents. 
So I walked around that day around West Harlem. And of course, I got lost. It's been about making a new life for myself, but nothing gave me more pride and joy than when my mom came to Fortune's Family Day. My brothers, my sisters, nieces, and nephews, everybody was there. We were sitting outside and we were eating and my mama turns around to me and she looks at me and she says to me, I am so proud of you. That right there, those words right there meant more to me than anything I could have ever wanted. You know, the castle people kept on telling me that I have to do the work, but they created this place which allowed me to dig deep inside myself. At one of the Thursday night community meetings, I was rushing eloquently. When Stanley Richards challenged me, easy, he said, you always amuse us and even inspire us when you speak. But when there is no audience, who are you? And I started to respond and he cut me, I thought to respond and he cut me off. You don't have to answer to me or any of us. That's something you have to answer to only one person and that's easy. Look in the mirror tonight and ask that person who he is and what he, what does he want? And that's when the hard work, the real hard work began. I stayed at the castle for over a year, and then I began to develop my own plan. I was hired part-time in the education unit. It just led to me being hired full-time in the alternative to incarceration unit, working with kids 16, 17 years old. Kids were going through things I went through more than 20 years ago. The times have changed, but the feelings are the same. I began to speak at public forums, spoke on radio, on television, representing thousands of men just like me who are still behind bars. When I finally made it back to the castle, some of the residents that came up to me, was like, yo, you should have called us. We would have came and got you. But you know, I knew I had to do that on my own. And besides, I didn't have a phone. And if I had a phone, I wouldn't have known how to use it anyway. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, the thing that I remember the most about walking around West Harlem that day was seeing children playing a sight I hadn't seen for 30 years. I have since reestablished ties with my brothers and sisters. On weekends, I go out to my sister's house in Long Island. At night when the kids are asleep, we sit out on the porch, talk about our wild, crazy childhoods, trying to make sense of it all. I was six years old when they took me away from my mother. She gave me a St. Christopher medal and told me it would protect me. As she was walking away, I took it off and threw it on the ground. I was angry. They weren't taking us away. She was throwing us away. 34 years later, I'm sitting on my sister's porch when she turns to me and says, I have something for you. When she handed it to me, I was amazed at how shiny it still was, but even more amazed that I knew what it was. I put it on, and this time I didn't take it off. It says, St. Christopher, protect me. After nearly two years at the castle, I moved into my own apartment run by the Fortune Society. I've been employed as a case manager but for Metro Plus Health and I remain a dedicated member of RTA. I continue to come to the castle for Thursday night meetings because I need to stay connected to the place where I became face to face with myself. I go to NA meetings and I even sing at Fortune's monthly cafe in Long Island City. In 2015, I learned I had, 2016, I learned I had prostate cancer and began radiation treatments. But as the song says, I'm still here. Drug free for eight years, something I haven't done since I was 14. Through the cast, I've been going to Broadway, off-Broadway shows. My high is from the life I'm leading today. A while back ago, uh, Christine Eversol came to the castle for a performance, and when she got there, she came up to my upstairs to my room, and we started talking and taking pictures on my cell phone like we're best friends. When she started to perform, I was thinking, wow, 
a year ago, I was in a New York State prison. And today I'm having conversation and taking pictures in my room with this two-time Tony Award winning actress. Isn't that something? You know, I found the love and the acceptance I've always been looking for. Without the drugs, without the alcohol. It seemed easy, but this road is hard to find. I like Vilma today. Or should I say, I love Vilma today. And you know what? <laughs> it's such a wonderful feeling. Well, for me, in the following year, in 2016, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. So face to face with death once again. And after spending 40 years trying to kill myself with drugs, I wanted to live. I didn't want to die addicted. I was hospitalized while I was living at the castle. And the radiation treatments were successful. And then I was ready for the world. I went out of the academy in July of 2014. To my own apartment in the Bronx. Drug free. I even stopped I even stopped smoking cigarettes. After that last trip to Rikers, I knew that the crazy self-destructive life was over for me. I remember looking around the bullpen and for the first time I could smell the piss and vomit. For the first time I realized that I was allowing myself to be treated like an animal. And for the first time I felt like I didn't belong there. Every other time I was arrested, I always felt like that's where I belonged and that's what I deserved. But not on that last trip. It was my time. That's what happened. It was my time. There are thousands and thousands of guys just like me running around New York City, abandoned or abused as kids, growing up in youth houses and ended up in crack houses. I knew and I still know a ton of them. We'd run into each other and tell each other war stories. Sooner or later, you get tired. It's your time. The lucky ones have someone or something to hold on to when that happens. I have a woman who loves me, and I was blessed with the castle where they showed me away. As a kid, and even as an adult, I always had a book in my back pocket. Reading saw me through a lot of tough times. I owe a lot to Jack London, Charles Dickens, Superman, Batman. I always knew there was something better. I just didn't know how to find it. My brother Nino will be getting out of prison soon. I know I can't do it for him, but I can show him the way. I can only hope that it's his time. I began by telling you that I served 30 years for a violent crime I committed 35 years ago. My feelings of remorse, guilt, and shame will never undo my offense. I never believed that I would ever be able to forgive myself. But there was a point when I made a conscious decision to do so. I participated in numerous therapeutic and educational programs, and then there were the artistic activities that I was involved in. It was really the power, the potency of those feelings I just told you about, along with the forgiveness I received from members of my family and the educational programs and the therapeutic programs that moved me in that positive direction. That also included a re-examination of the motives behind and the consequences of my actions. I regret what it cost for me to develop into a morally responsible human. But because of that, I'm all the more committed to never again being the person that I once was. And with that, to understanding and cherishing freedom. And Ferris Bueller's day off, he says, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop once in a while to look around, you might miss it. Well, I'm seeing a lot of things for the first time these days. My name is Casimiro Torres and I lived at the castle. I was homeless when I arrived in 2005 with 67 arrests and 16 years in prison. Today, I'm employed by the Fortune Society 
I am a husband, I am a father, and I am a taxpayer. My name is Philip Hall. I came to the castle in August of 2016 after serving 30 years in a New York State prison. Today, I live in my own apartment. I'm successfully employed and I can modestly add that I am a playwright and I'm also the ta also a taxpayer. My name is Wilmer Tis Donovan. I'm a 58 year old Hispanic woman who came to the castle in July of 2007 after concluding my second state prison bin. Well, today I've recently moved to Harlem. I have a beautiful apartment in Harlem. I also recently got promoted to executive assistant to our vice president of programs, Mr. Rob DeLeon. Um, and I too am a taxpayer. My name is Urban Hunt. I've been called easy since I was a kid. I'm a former castle resident. I'm a recovering everything with more than 50 arrests. At 67 years of age, I'm just starting my life. Well, um, I moved out of the castle, like I said, in 2014. I've been in my own apartment for the past seven years. I have 12 plants and a cat. I still attend community meetings through Zoom at the castle. And I too, am a, I'm a retired taxpayer. Yeah. 